it would be produced at an affordable price. And I mean, that, that doesn't get directly addressed here, other than to suggest that the subsidies for certain kinds of food are perverting or distorting um, the market and making unhealthy food cheaper than it would be otherwise. Um, but your point definitely is, is I mean, there are many, many people who would agree that um, it's not fair to advocate policies that would um, disproportionately impact lower income groups who are obviously stretched to, in their decisions about food, food of different kinds, food versus medicine, that kind of thing. There are a lot of people with their hands up. Um, yeah. So there are, there are other things that could be done. Um, uh, yeah, you've had your hand up for a while. Okay, organic has got, under the official rules, organic has got a few chemicals that are permitted. Okay. Okay, yeah. Are you sure that was a $35,000 SUV they were riding in? I think it was a minivan. But no, I mean, I, okay. I mean, I mean, we enjoy some of the lowest food prices in the world as a percentage of our budgets in this country. Um, and I mean, to that extent, it's perhaps the case that everyone should be re willing to at least consider paying more for their food. Um, you had something? Okay, okay. The, the, the defense mounted in the name of cheap food uh, is perhaps blinkered, is missing out on some broader, more fundamental questions. Um, I had a conversation a couple months ago with a scientist who works for the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and I said to him, we were talking about debates about climate change in relation to food production, um, and we were talking a little bit about Michael Pollan and the message that he's been able to promote or advance and his success in doing that. And, um, and also right now there's lots and lots of people who are promoting the idea of paying um, ranchers for the carbon sequestered in rangeland soils, um, even though that amount is actually very small and very difficult to measure. And I said to him, why can't we just put out there the idea that if if we taxed carbon very highly and petroleum became very expensive and fertilizer became very expensive and all those f c corn fields in, in Iowa um, were suddenly no longer as profitable um, and there were some kind of way of paying farmers for the soil that they or the carbon they sequester in their soils, that we might end up with a situation in which large parts of the Midwest are taken out of corn and put back into prairie grasses um, that would grow on their own and wouldn't require tractors and which would produce enormous quantities of biomass that, animal, that cattle could eat and um, produce beef with a smaller carbon footprint. And, and he just looked at me and he said, forget it, you haven't got a chance. He said, you will never see that argument in the pages of the New York Times because the agricultural lobby will not allow it to be fought. He was like, you, you haven't got a chance. It was very sobering. This is a guy who actually thinks is pretty iconoclastic and outspoken and sort of outside the box within his professional circles. He spends a lot of time in Washington with Congress people and talking about these issues. He works on the food bill a lot. And he was just like, try it. See if you can make that argument and get any traction with it. He actually said, he said, the food lobby has got people who are extremely smart and they will hit you on this affordability thing. And they will counter every argument you make with pages and pages of counter arguments. And it will all come down to your telling the American people that they have to pay more for their food. Yeah. Would buying local impact foreign farmers negatively? Um, I, I believe that the I believe that buying locally. I mean, first of all, if people all bought locally out of choice, even if they had to pay more, um, certainly that would have ripple effects in the larger marketplace. Um, and it might look as like well, it might resemble a kind of tariff barrier, uh, but it would not be a tariff barrier legally speaking. It would not violate World Trade Organization rules, for example. Um, chances are that the two are pretty decoupled from each other in the sense that um, the the impacts on rural, on third world farmers or foreign farmers are mediated through the question of subsidies for things like corn. And buying locally may or may not have any effect on subsidies for corn, right? Um, or subsidies for other crops that, that, in, that give American farmers an advantage in foreign markets for those crops. So, I mean, yeah, I suppose if we imagine a world in which everybody bought locally, but that might actually relieve the pressure because it might mean that more farmers didn't export their crops at all. And in most third world settings, it's, it's the actual, it's the arrival of these crops from subsidized places overseas that creates... Oh, the for them to, to uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, we're a net, well, actually, as of a couple years ago, we ceased being a net exporter of food for the first time, like, in hundreds of years. But, um, yeah, I think for commodity crops like corn and soybeans, we're an exporting country, and it's not that we are somehow the necessary market for those farmers. All right. Right. At this point, at this point, buying locally is not likely to change the growing practices of farmers in the Midwest. Um, but. The oil blurb? I think they were just trying to point out one of the weaknesses, the potential weaknesses in the system. It's, extreme, it's extremely dependent on high inputs of fossil fuels, and that represents a potential sort of weak link in the event that supplies of fossil fuels are disrupted, right? So uh, should I give the lecture? <laughs> do, we, do we even have enough time for it? Um, we've got about 45 minutes. Um, there are a lot of slides here. I'm trying to cover a lot of ground, including um, Garrett Hardin, Tragedy of the Commons, which was for last time. Um, there's also the chapter from Connolly, which I trust you've read by now. Um, it's not directly addressed in these slides, although I'm happy to discuss it in connection with some of these points. Um, let me see how this moves forward. Um, so this, the, the readings for today, we're about um, agriculture, particularly industrial agriculture. Um, the, what it's for, how it's practiced, is very consistent with many of the arguments put forward in the movie. Um, so let's just sort of get started. The world food crisis, 
uh, of uh, two years ago um, has receded from the headlines, interestingly. Um, but two years ago, it was very much in the headlines, and it actually is alluded to there in the last couple minutes of the film. Um, this is from The Economist. Uh, this is a silent tsunami, says Josette Sheeran of the World Food Program. A wave of food price inflation is moving through the world, leaving riots and shaking governments in its wake for the first time in 30 years. Food protests are erupting in many places at once. The Economist had a rather interesting take on this. Um, they quoted here, we are the canary in the mine. For the middle classes, it means cutting out medical care. For those on $2 a day, it means cutting out meat and taking the children out of school. For those on $1 a day, it means cutting out meat and vegetables and eating only cereals. And for those on 50 cents a day, it means total disaster. Um, then The Economist actually interpreted this very much in terms of, believe it or not, um, government support for agriculture and argued that it was declining and that the um, diminishing returns of crops in developing countries, so this is average rate of growth, uh, 1961 to 2004, you see a dramatic decline. Uh, well, it's actually exaggerated somewhat here. We're only talking about between 0 and 12 percent. But it appeared that the rate of growth in production, in productivity, of these um, of corn and rice and wheat in developing nations has declined significantly since the 60s. Um, grain prices were climbing, as we've noted already. And the economists interpreted this as a failure of policy. Uh, actually, here. Most agricultural research in developing countries is financed by governments. In the 1980s, governments started to reduce green revolutionary spending, either out of complacency, believing the problem of food had been licked, or because they preferred to involve the private sector. But many of the private firms brought in to replace state researchers turned out to be rent-seeking monopolists. And in the 1980s and 90s, huge farm surpluses from the rich world were being dumped on markets, depressing prices and returns on investment. Spending on farming as a share of total public spending in developing countries fell by half between 1980 and 2004. Um, David Tillman, in one of the art readings for today, says because of the Green Revolution, agriculture has met the food needs of most of the world's population, even as the population doubled during the past four decades. So here we have, I mean, the economists are making an interesting, interesting argument that what we need is increased government support for agriculture um, to keep productivity rising, a kind of Green Revolution redox. Um, is that really a viable answer? And what would it actually, what kinds of things might we need um, either in place of it or to modify it from its previous model, which is essentially U.S. industrial agriculture? So quick big picture comments. We've, we've seen throughout the semester kind of two contrasting views, Malthusian and Marxian, on the question of surpluses and scarcities. In the Malthusian view, scarcities are imposed by nature. They are best overcome through the market. People without jobs or income are redundant, and overpopulation is the problem. On the Marxian view, by contrast, scarcities are socially produced by private property of, in the means of production. They are intrinsic to capitalist markets. People without jobs or income are produced by and contribute to the maintenance of capitalism. And the specter of scarcity is an ideological weapon. After all, scarcity is just the other face of surplus. Now, these two frameworks are useful in making sense of these debates about food production and food policy. Um, the article by Calloran Brummer, which I asked you to read, focuses in on something that was highlighted very forcefully in the film, which is productionism. It wasn't called that in the film, but uh, Michael Pollan described it well. He's, the purpose of our food system, the sort of guiding principle of it, would appear to be simply the efficient, in quotes, um, production of as much food as possible. And the, in fact, overproduction of food um, relative to our needs, uh, even if it drives down the price of uh, corn or the price the prices received by farmers. Um, and in fact, he suggests that that's precisely its goal, right? That this is a policy oriented to the interests of um, not farmers and not even consumers, but the intermediary sectors, particularly uh, industrial sectors, for whom uh, the raw materials produced by farmers are a key input, whether they're thinking about turning around and making potato chips or beef or a whole variety of other products, many of them not even food, that, um, for which things like corn are a, a central input. Now, Keller and Brummer suggest that this productionism um, is the problem, and in fact is um, perverse and irrational. At the heart of the production paradigm is the realization of the greatest possible quantity of agricultural product. Other, product. other factors, such as ecological or aesthetic values of the agro-ecosystem, receive scant attention. The design of agricultural systems is based on commodity production and its attendant economics. They quote a man named Paul Thompson, I forget exactly who he is. Productionism is, productionism is an absurd philosophical position on the face of it. There are no sophisticated philosophical defenses of productionism. Arguably, no individual has ever believed in it. The current need, Keller and Brummer go on to say, in the West is not increased production. That starving people live in a world with abundant food suggests that what is missing is the purchasing power of the poor. The imperative of feeding the world through industrial agriculture is a dogma with little foundation. They, they suggest that what is needed is a broader philosophical position they call post-mechanism, in which we get beyond thinking about agricultural systems or the environment more generally, simply as a sort of mechanical system that we can manipulate and modify and engineer to produce whatever we want. In science, post-mechanism involves the adoption of an indeterministic, stochastic view of nature. The consequence of context-dependent agriculture is that universal farming principles are not achievable. In other words, farmers should be supported to farm small areas well rather than to farm large areas poorly. Any reactions to that? Do you think we can mount a public awareness campaign in favor of post-mechanism? No, me neither. Yes, I would suggest that this is quite compatible with the broader, more holistic um, philosophy of organic farming, in which it's not simply a question of defining which chemicals or other inputs are allowed um, and leaving everything else alone. That it's very much, I mean, context-dependent. What they mean is agroecosystems should be adapted to the specifics of their geographical context, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, this may be a compelling philosophical argument. It may not get very far in the sort of broader public debate. You have something? There, so there, there's a book that was written by a called Grand Debate. Yes, Julie Gottman's book. Like, uh, and this basically argues that uh, industrial organic farming is not, uh, is not a sustainable future, and the uh, sustainable healthy food philosophical movement is going to have to sort of have to be based on farms like Joe Dalton. Well, I'm not sure that's quite Julie's argument, but it is in there in the book. Um, anyone familiar with this book? Julie Gottman is one of our graduates, by the way. This is her dissertation from our department. Um, and she raised quite a stir, basically pointing out that organic agriculture can become a branch of capitalist industrial agriculture just as well as non-organic farming can, and that a lot of the goals of the original organic farming movement um, are ac actually at risk of being lost, even as organic becomes more and more successful. Um, she also pointed out that there are a lot of other things sort of obscured in the focus on organic farming, um, such as labor practices, and that big organic farms can be just as exploitative of labor as big non-organic farms might be. Um, I don't know if I quite captured the point you were trying to make, but... Um, There, you know, it's funny. It, it's funny. I think she would suggest that like small scale is important um, if one really wishes to see 
sort of the broader environmental and societal benefits. Um, however, I think she would also say that at the end of the day, this is not just about agriculture or the size of the farms or the inputs on the farms, but this is actually about capitalism. Um, and that that's what we need to think about when we think about these questions. And she's also, I think, quite frustrated with those who would um, uphold simply organic or simply local as a solution in and of itself. Um, because of, I mean, in some cases, because of questions of equity. You know, what, what can people really afford? And to what extent, I mean, she, she objects to the way this gets cast as simply a consumer preference issue um, and not a, a sort of structural systemic issue about the way production is organized in general and in agriculture in particular. Is there someone, you guys something? Right. Yeah, no, I think, I think she feels that focusing on individual consumer choices in the marketplace is actually, uh, you know, no matter how much promise it might have, it actually represents a radical narrowing of the political, the realm of political debate about these issues. Um, brief interlude here, I was struck by the ways in which um, Keller and Brommer's argument about a post, uh, post-mechanistic philosophy resembled some of the arguments made by Aldo Leopold um, under, the, under the rubric of a land ethic. Um, this actually gets to the point brought up about the, the, the well-being of animals, for example. Um, Leopold says the land ethic simply enlarges the boundary of the community to include, to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively the land. Um, if Peter Singer's argument is that animals have rights and those rights are as valid as the rights of humans, the land ethic on some readings will extend that and say, you know, it's not just animals, it's actually soil that has rights or should be included in our underlying notion of, you know, the members of our community that deserve respect and recognition as much as people do. Um, it's interesting that he also um, in this lecture, I may have mentioned this previously, um, at the beginning of World War II, Leopold gave a lecture which got published many, many, many years later in which he reflected on uh, the relationship of ecology to politics and whether we could learn things from ecology that were relevant to politics. And remember, this is March 1941. The United States is not yet involved in World War II, but the Germans are marching their way um, all over Europe, right? He says, it is probably true that food can, by drawing on aerial and geological stores of fertilizer, be increased indefinitely. But it is far from true, as Darwin once postulated, that animal populations are limited mainly by food. Um, anybody unclear what he means here by aerial and geological stores of fertilizer? What's an aerial store of fertilizer? Yeah. It's the nitrogen floating around the atmosphere, which is not useful when it's floating around the, um, in the atmosphere, but the production of synthetic fertilizers is, um, is achieved by grabbing that nitrogen out of the air um, and requires a lot of fossil fuel, or at least a lot of energy to do that. Um, so that's what he's talking about. But let's get carry on with this point. Um, it is far from, as Darwin once postulated, that animal populations are limited mainly by food. One of the most emphatic lessons of ecology is that animal populations are usually self-limiting, that the mechanisms are diverse, even for a single species, and that they often shift inexplicably from one kind to another, that the usual sequences for some limitation to act before the end of the current food supply is in sight. Um, by that argument, this focus on food, or the equation of food with human population and survival, um, is, uh, is erroneous, right? That it's not actually food that, that functions as the limiting factor that affects populations in animal, in animal communities anyway. Um, Keller and Brummer go on. The current need in the West is, oh, hold on. I'm going, am I going backwards? No. That slide is duplicated. So, David Tillman's article, since 1960, the worldwide rate of application of nitrogen fertilizers has increased by seven times, and now exceeds seven times 10 to the seventh tons of nitrogen per year. Um, this is obviously a key part of enabling increasing production. Um, here's an article from a couple years ago from The Independent reporting on research suggesting that genetic modification, in fact, is not going to produce more food and is not the solution to food production problems. Um, and then goes on to uh, link the question of food production in the first world um, and growing global interconnectedness between these markets to the problem of deforestation in the Amazon, um, which somehow now becomes a little interlude in the lecture, which I think I might actually skip because we're short of time. Yes, I'll skip that. There's some interesting questions here about um, the relationship of of livestock to crops, um, and gets at one of the other articles that I asked you to read for today um, on restoring the links or losing links between livestock and land. Um, yeah, I think I better just, you guys want me to talk about those slides or should we just keep going? You don't care. Keep going, okay. Um, we've talked about the metabolic rift before. Um, the article, this is the one by Roseman Naylor and company. Um, the, that's where these slides come from. Um, makes the point that efficiency in production of crops and of animals is seen as a separate, or as two separate questions. That livestock and crops are delinked in terms of um, the actual production in any one place, right? And this gets back to the, you know, the metabolic rift. You know, do you, do, does all that manure get tra- put back on fields, or does it accumulate in these, these enormous settling ponds and become problems such as were depicted at the end of the movie there when that one uh, hog operation in North Carolina? Or was it the one that flooded? Yeah. Um, the large scales of production generate unmanageable waste problems, surpluses of crops, low prices, and further industrialization of livestock production. Um, I guess, God, I almost don't need to use these slides at this point because of the movie, huh? We've got this pretty much covered. Um, kind of makes me want to go back and talk about this after all. But I guess I won't. Um, this is Chinese annual meat consumption, Brazilian annual soybean production. They're going up. Um, there are a lot of questions right now about whether soybean production or beef production is the driving force behind deforestation in the Amazon. Um, uh, this map depicts cattle density per hectare uh, between 1990 and 2005 uh, in the Amazon basin. You can see that it's you know, encroached significantly in here, although there's some evidence to suggest